It's, it's a little bit of the picture. It's another investor intention survey, actually, which shows that what we've seen over the last years that at least a lot of surveys show investors are, let's say, going more to the value-add side. You had these these kind of headlines in the news, might it be Property EU or what other real estate publication, saying investors are moving up the risk curve. And I always wondered, are they really moving up the risk curve? And I think part of the story is that the investors are actually going for value add simply because they need the return side, but not because they want the risk side associated with it. We see a lot of investors currently underwriting value add investments just to achieve core returns they, uh, they, it, to achieve returns they had with core investments maybe five, six years ago, simply because the relative pricing of real estate uh, it, in a, is, is still attractive but brought down yields tremendously that with a pure core strategy, most investors are, are very <coughs> find very difficult to achieve their target returns. So I would say it's not moving up the risk curve. It's, uh, it's more or less uh, the, the search for, for return that, that keeps a lot of investors uh, going for value-add or being willing to underwrite value-add returns or in, in an environment where core simply does not uh, generate the, the, the necessary return side. And if investors then are trying to try to get an, a picture on where to invest, I think we are currently in a situation, I plotted here GDP and inflation figures for, for, for three major region, regions, US, UK, and Eurozone, where you see GDP growth and inflation, they don't tell you a clear picture where to invest. There's not a real fundamental difference, so there's not a top pick saying we have the US outgrowth Europe, so, every, so capital will go to the US because there's a cyclical opportunity, or the, the capital goes to the UK. So I think... <clears throat> that, that is the other picture we have currently, that the, major, the traditional major investment markets, they don't show a very clear picture in the sense that there is a fundamental difference between growth rates or inflation rates, g giving a clear favorite where, where should the money go on that side. Taking a little bit of a closer look possibly on, 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 this, on the countries under consideration, I plotted here some, some growth, and, and growth figures and CPI figures for, for the Benelux countries, France, and the EU as a whole. You see that, yes, growth rates have more or less picked up in the last years. The Netherlands might be the most extreme example in the last, let's say, three, four years with real pickup in growth and also a return of confidence from, from the investor side. But the right-hand side of the graph also shows you one other difficulty a lot of investors have. The nearly non-existent inflation makes it quite hard to really see where, where will, let's say, possibly inflation-linked growth come from. We don't have a lot of economic growth, but there's also not the, the point that inflation might help to at least uh, pick up nominal values that, that might mitigate some of the issues we have. The other thing is, and that's the point, the, the quite interesting point when it comes to the Benelux, when you look at the right map, you see that in the Benelux regions, you have relatively big cities. You know, they might, in absolute terms, be not the biggest ones, but relatively speaking, if you look at the overall population of the countries, the cities are relatively big, meaning they are important for the country in itself. So that's, for a real estate investor, one point saying that that makes the city attractive because it's not only the absolute size of a city that, that, that uh, results in attractiveness, it's also the relative so, uh, size of a city because then it tells you how, if you believe in a country and then, uh, then the, the relative size of the city is much more the, the, the issue when, when you really want to diversify within the country than the absolute size. And the, and the, the left side shows you a little bit of the, the challenges we have with the aging population that in, in Europe that is increasingly shaping the markets. And I think that it, that has fundamental implications for, for the office investment because if the population is aging, then possibly your workforce is declining faster than, than the overall population if you have a declining population. So these kind of aging process has huge implications for the workforce and therefore for office demand side. But it also has an implication for the, for the retail sector because retail demand of a 70-plus-year-old household might be completely different from, from a household in the 30s and 40s. So also for the retail structure side, these aging process will shape the things going forward. And, and I think that is one of the things investors increasingly try to understand. When it comes to residential, we always talk about demographics. When it comes to retail, we increasingly think about demographics. 
When it comes to offices, we normally never think about demographics, although it might be the hardest hit sector. If we have a declining and aging population, the office sector will be the one hit hardest and hit first, actually. So that is some of the things going forward that will be one of the challenges. But also one of the opportunities, if you have a growing city, you have a young population and, and in an area where people are migrating, are migrating to. Coming more to the transactional side, and that's uh, rolling annual volumes for, for Europe, what you see is, looking at the Benelux region, it's only 6% of overall transaction volumes in Europe. So it's, relatively speaking, a small amount of capital that is invested of the total investment volume in Europe in the Benelux region. But you have to keep in mind that the three big countries, Germany, France, and the UK, account for about two-thirds of all investments. So of, of the remaining roughly 30%, 20% uh, goes to the Benelux region, and that is, is heavily, let's say, it, it, it's a substantial market in this sense. Nevertheless, it's on the European scale, the Benelux still is quite a small market. But you have to say the volumes have been increasing in the, in the last three years. It's partly due to a lot of the, the headline or big trophy asset transaction you have seen in, the, in, in, in Brussels, but also to a lot of the portfolio deals we have seen in the Netherlands in the last two years, because the capital has returned to, to the Dutch market, and with all the, the trophy assets traded in, in Brussels, it's also been, been one of the drivers of these developments. This is a little bit of a different picture what, what Jos showed you already about historical low yield levels. Uh, on, on the right-hand side, you see the, the, in, in red the average European prime yield for, for the 30-plus markets we monitor. The, the gray area around this is more or less the yield dispersion, so that's the, the, the highest and the lowest prime yields of the 30 markets we're monitoring. And you see a, a downward trend on these average European yield. It has never been that low before, but the question is, what does it mean now for the, for the real estate investor? And uh, normally, I always try to put in some graphs on, on long-term interest rates. If you look at overnight rates on a 30-, 35-year horizon, you see they have a negative trend. And the question is, if interest rates are not in a mean reverting world, why should real estate be a mean reverting world, meaning historical lows inevitably means that, that we are having a, a turning point in the cycle? The interesting point I, I want to point out is if you look at the Brussels prime yield, they, they look relatively attractive. It's above the European average. But that's the prime yield for the typical 369 leases. And if you have these trophy assets with an 18-year lease or 20-year lease that are traded in, in Brussels in the last two years, they are trading at 4% or even below 4%. So that's, that's a different picture than if, if the trophy asset is on the market, then these, these Brussels prime yield that might be relatively attractive at the end comes down to levels where that typically these type of risk, low-risk investments are priced across Europe. Looking more on the, on the geographical side, what you see looking at office investments, you see that in the Benelux, it's, it's very concentrated. You have in Belgium, it's more or less mainly Brussels where you have the office transactions. Luxembourg, it's Luxembourg, okay, there's, there's not really any other office market out there. In the Netherlands, it's a little more diverse. You have a little more cities that, that investors are looking at. In the retail sector, it's a similar picture. The only difference is the prime yield in Brussels is now below the European average, so that's more of or less a reflection of the, the yield level the European capital should have in comparison to, to the European average. And taking a, a look at the regional dimension of the transactions in the last 12 months, you see retail is really, really a much more regional play. It's, it's much more a, a diverse play. It's much more about the demand side. Because retail is, is, if you go for retail, it's a play where you really have to understand where the demand is going and where the demand is, is, is also there, where the people are living, while, while the commuting patterns and the, the purchasing power patterns in the different countries. I think that is, that is a little bit of the background, how, how investors view these, these two sectors quite very differently.